Okay. So hello everyone. Uh, uh, I am Beruz Kamali. Uh, uh, I'm the director of uh, the Sharmin and Bijan Musawar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. Uh, and uh, this is the first of our series uh, for the fall semester of conversations uh, with uh, scholars uh, and uh, <clears throat> mostly about new books that have been uh, released uh, this uh, past year. And, uh, and I thought that the most appropriate thing to do for the uh, beginning of our series is uh, to do, introduce you to our uh, two new uh, postdoctoral fellows uh, who are with me today. And, uh, and uh, we are gonna have a conversation about their work uh, and how they ended up being in Princeton uh, for this moment virtually, but hopefully soon uh, in person. And uh, many of you will get a chance to meet them in person uh, in our lecture series that hopefully would resume after this crisis of COVID-19 ends. And I'm hoping that all of you are uh, healthy in uh, good spirits. Uh, and uh, we went through a very hard time at the beginning of COVID in New Jersey and New York. Uh, but um, at this moment, uh, ironically, New Jersey and New York are one of the safest places in the country and uh, we're trying to keep it that way for the foreseeable future. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce you to our new fellows, uh, uh, Mariam Alemzadeh um, and, um, and uh, Milad uh, Odabai. Um, and uh, we were also had to share this with you that we were so lucky that uh, uh, we, uh, first of all, we, uh, had a very, very competitive pool of, uh, for this year's fellows. And, um, and, uh, and we were also lucky that uh, we were able to finish our search for our uh, uh, postdoctoral fellowship right before the uh, pandemic hit. So uh, I feel especially fortunate that, that uh, we can host uh, two of the most uh, promising young scholars of Iranian studies uh, at uh, the Iran Center here. So let me start with uh, Dr. Alamzadeh. Uh, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and your education background and, uh, and then we go to Dr. Odabai and then we'll talk about your work a little bit. Uh, Maria? Sure, thank you so much, Beruz. Um, can you hear me and see me, everything yes. works? All right. Um, let me first say that I am really excited to be part of the uh, Sharmin and Bijar Musawar Rahmani um, Center. It's really a, a, an opportunity for me to engage more in the Iranian studies uh, um, research scholarship and be in the companion of such wonderful scholars as uh, you and Milad and everyone else at the center. So I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I am a sociologist by training. I got my PhD in sociology in 2018 at the University of Chicago. Before that, I had some uh, graduate education in social sciences and sociology in Iran and also some background in Iranian music uh, where I did, uh, in, in which I did my BA. But yeah, that's a, uh, well, that's a very old story. Uh, I'm too far but, from but it now. But very interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> um, and uh, so after the PhD, uh, for the past two years before starting here, I was a junior research fellow at Brandeis University's Crown Center for Middle East Studies, uh, which was a fantastic two years. I uh, got to develop two articles um, out of my uh, dissertation. I, I guess I'll talk about it more mm -hmm. later. And um, yeah, it led me here to this moment of virtually being a part of the Princeton University community. Okay, wonderful. And Milad? Uh, I, hi, I also want to thank you for this opportunity to speak with you about my work. 
Uh, and also more generally, thank you, uh, Femke de Reuter and Becky Pagnon, as well as the other fellows uh, for a very welcoming start to this fellowship. Although we are starting virtually, uh, it has been uh, quite wonderful and uh, very uh, welcoming uh, start for me. And I'm very excited to join uh, the sort of intellectual community and the intellectual initiatives that you have created along with other fellows as, fellows, as well as Mariam. And I am very much looking forward to um, uh, joining you in person whenever uh, it becomes possible, I hope very soon. Um, uh, so, so would you ask for a little bit of also a personal history? In yes. OK. So I, I, I grew up in Iran until 2001. I finished my high school in Iran, and I was um, I sort of came of age during the years of Sazandegi, which were uh, years of after the war with Iraq. And I blame my first degree, which was in engineering, mm -hmm. based on this historical fate. Um, I, uh, At least you have something to blame it on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> uh, I studied and worked as an engineer for a few years, but also in, in, in California. And that also became an experience of defamiliarization from the sort of social and historical context of Iran. And then I turned to study of political theory and later anthropology um, at UC Berkeley. I, I uh, finished my uh, training and my dissertation in anthropology at UC Berkeley uh, in 2018. Uh, broadly, my research and teaching bring together critical and anthropological approaches to the study of religion and politics, translation and knowledge production, as well as challenges of cultural transmission and subjectivity in context of social political violence and historical unrest and transformation, such as the context of modern Iran and contemporary Middle East. Uh, I have come to appreciate and understand and advance anthropology and critical theory as modes of inquiry into rift within and between uh, connected historical itineraries. I am very excited to also, like I am, to bring uh, the, the work that I've done to the space of Iranian studies and to the center specifically um, as, as we are we find ourselves, as if, if you will, in a, in a moment of also uh, a repetition of unrest and suppression in relationship to um, Iran in Iran. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, I I always uh, mention this uh, when I'm talking about uh, uh, Iranian politics, uh, about the similarities between politics in Iran and the U.S. And, uh, and uh, there are so many different levels of, of similarity that one can identify there. And, uh, and I'm hoping that, that in engaging with your work, uh, many other people can also sort of identify these similarities uh, uh, culturally, politically, and, uh, and historically. And, um, so, uh, and, and you mentioned the moment of unrest, and uh, of course we are living uh, in the U.S. through such a uh, truly historical moment, uh, and uh, whether this historical moment would be a lasting moment or not, we don't know, but, but nevertheless, uh, 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 scholars of Iran and people who lived in Iran can identify with these type of moments that, that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> a series of uh, grievances are voiced uh, on, uh, on the streets and uh, and that kind of kind of uh, engagement, the political engagement, is so familiar to to Iranians and scholars of Iran, and uh, and uh, hopefully we can sort of find uh, <clears throat> uh, points of um, uh, common interest uh, in the future with some of our other colleagues to to work and think through these issues uh, in the near future. Um, uh, I want to ask uh, Mariam to talk about uh, her dissertation a little bit for the uh, sake of transparency. I have to also mention that I was also in Mariam's uh, dissertation committee. And uh, this is the first time uh, 
I uh, got to know her and her work and uh, and it was truly a privilege uh, to be part of that committee, very really strong committee and and, uh, and a very creative and innovative work uh, that, uh, that this is the kind of work that I really admire, that, that uh, things that appear to be uh, simply explained away is problematized and, and, uh, and, uh, and unpacked in, in uh, very important ways. So I want to uh, ask her to talk a little bit about uh, her dissertation and, and uh, what is it about and, and, uh, and uh, some of her findings that was surprising to, to you, Mariam, that there were those findings. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, I really appreciate it. And it was, was really a privilege to have you on the committee and um, be able to learn from uh, your knowledge and insights. So um, my work in general is on post-revolutionary state building in Iran and specifically on the formation and consolidation of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, also known very well to Iranians as Sebaf. It started with me thinking that we have heard so many times that the Iranian authorities call the Islamic Republic a revolutionary government, or we hear the uh, Sepah propaganda calling itself a revolutionary military and causing a lot of um, debate actually around it in Iran itself as well. But we tend to, as you said, explain it away as like part of a very dominant ideological discourse uh, that doesn't really have um, uh, practical repercussions tied back to it. On the other hand, when I started studying the uh, IRGC's formation history and its um, uh, function in the first couple of years after the, re the revolution, including uh, into the first and second year of the Iran-Iraq war, I realized that, again, despite our um, uh, common tendency to explain it away by, okay, it was a uh, fully supported ideological militia uh, dedicated from the get-go. So it had all the political support, all the financial support. So it's not surprising that it overtook the military sphere and in the later years, the economic and uh, political sphere. So it's not really a puzzle. So when I started reading, I found out that that's not actually the case. It took two to three years uh, for the political disputes in, uh, in the government, in the political sphere to be settled in favor of uh, uh, Khomeinists or Islamists. Um, and it was only then after the IRGC had gone through uh, a lot of civil unrest, uh, as, like most specifically the, the more, and, and uh, the most prolonged one being the Kurdish conflict, it, it had participated heavily in repressing it, and then it had participated in the Iran-Iraq war alongside uh, the Iranian regular army, Atish. And so two to three years had passed before top-down organization, financial support, political, uh, like uh, unconditional political support started to flow their way. So um, the puzzle was how did they actually survive those few hectic years under war pressure, under civil war pressure, uh, under the pressure of heavy political dispute, and what actually kept them together, together positively, uh, what was the cohesive factor uh, behind their existence. And it could, the question I realized can be asked more broadly about uh, the Islamic Republic state building as well. What was it that um, kept the, uh, the Islamist state builders together and uh, uh, made them the eventual successful state builders? We always contributed to the repressive force of, okay, the first few years gave them the opportunity to eliminate all uh, the rivals, but then we can't explain, okay, they didn't have any political experience, how did they manage to uh, build a state from scratch? Um, so, and yeah, to go back to that, the first issue that I brought up, the revolutionariness that we hear so much about, I thought, okay, maybe if we look at these first few uh, definitive years, 
we might find traces of this revolutionary characters being institutionalized and continued in uh, their future, even after they were, so to speak, routinized or bureaucratized as a sort of a conventional uh, military and, and uh, the state apparatuses as well. Um, I generally found the two existing explanations for both state building and military building uh, somewhat unsatisfactory. The two being, of course, I'm speaking very generally and uh, crudely. One is that the, the Shia ideology and symbolism worked as a unifying factor, helping either the Khomeinis, the Islamists, and the Revolutionary Guards to become a single unit, to single functioning unit. And the other being the existing infrastructure, the networks of mosques, seminaries, the, even the coteries, um, that helped uh, Islamists take over uh, the revolution after it happened. Um, more recent scholarship has shown that neither of these, including your work, Beruz, that neither of these by itself explains the workings, the daily functioning of um, um, these institutions and their like gradual formation. I went to 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 add to this. I uh, uh, found that if we focus on um, the activists or the state builders practices in a Bourdieuian sense instead, we get an actual sense of the gradual institution building. And by practice, I mean the, the know-hows, the dispositions, the automatic uh, response to problems, the automatic problem solving methods that um, uh, they just like habitually go to. Um, so to this goal, when uh, I did some field work or um, some research in Iran back in 2016 and 17, I managed to interview with about 40 uh, Revolutionary Guards members, Sepahis, of very different ranks from ex-chief commanders to foot soldiers. Uh, I talked to a few army officers who had helped uh, the IRGC's formation because a few of them did uh, participate in the formation of the IRGC in its early days. And uh, I also talked to uh, some um, either known or not very well-known revolutionary figures at the time who were um, still alive and um, willing to talk in Iran. And I also dug some archives there are fewer documents about those few years, but more archived interviews that have never been published. There are tons of them stored in Iran for anyone who would like to take a look. So sort of like oral history projects um, that are available to public more or less for research. So I went to there to uh, dig out for individual instances of action, decision-making and to find out uh, what are the, what practices show themselves to be routines, repeated, you know, and, and then by being repeated, they become institutionalized and shape that underlying foundation, the, that underlying order that works on the, underneath the apparent um, disorder that we see if we look at the first few years of the institutions. I don't want to take too long speaking. No, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, if if yeah. Uh, if I want to tell you a little bit about the findings, I I found that the 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 a major practice that would like showed itself again and again from pre-revolutionary times to when the IRGC went to war among mm -hmm. the these. Um, a particular revolutionary figures was a tendency for direct action for um, which was interpreted as revolutionary and mm -hmm. um, just just um, uh, cutting some slack for um, inferior ranks doing whatever they see fit and interpreting it as revolutionary or going against organizational decisions that a bunch of leaders have made together and just like going out and changing that organizational decision on a whim, acting in a different way and calling it again revolutionary. So this is the pattern that um, showed itself again and again. And I tried to show in my work how that was actually the informal logic of 
the organizations uh, in the early years. That's so fantastic. I mean, again, you know, uh, there are so many questions that you raise in your work and, and, uh, and hopefully uh, in the coming months and years, uh, we can engage more uh, uh, with those questions. And, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and once you're in person here, I'm sure that many people around you are going to raise a lot of different kinds of questions for you. But this so. is such a fantastic work. Let me uh, ask Milad the same question uh, on uh, uh, his um, dissertation. And I uh, understand that uh, Milad is uh, also having thinking about the, a second project at the same time. But I also need to say this, that, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, for, uh, for years, uh, 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 my uh, good late friend um, uh, Sabah Mahmoud always told me that that you know, oh God, I have this student. You know, you have to meet him. You know, <laughs> you know, I might never get a chance to to meet until you know he took an invitation to uh, uh, to Berkeley for me to to go there, and and Milad was there. We we met there, and uh, and. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I know that uh, um, uh, Sabo uh, hard, hardly praises people, and 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 then when she praises someone, it means quite a lot. <clears throat> so um, so we do have that uh, connection with uh, our good uh, uh, friend uh, um, and uh, uh, Sabo Mahmoud, who left us uh, unfortunately too soon. Um, but um, but Milad, uh, again, welcome and, and tell us a little bit about your uh, dissertation work and, and your project. Uh, uh, I would be <clears throat> happy to. So my dissertation was an ethnographic and historical study of practices of reading and translation of European social and political thought in contemporary Iran. It was uh, based on two years of field work in spaces of higher education in the universities, research centers of Shia seminaries, and private reading and translation circles in Tehran and Qom. Uh, the bulk of my research was done in 2014, but between 2009 and 2017, I visited Iran annually in what, what was first uh, preliminary field work that um, was central to formulating the project and then research trips and then follow-ups and basically building a conversation that continues to date with my interlocutors and people who I share my work and or read their works uh, and I hope to I, I imagine this to be a continuing um, conversation. Uh, my interlocutors were academics, seminarians, translators of theoretical texts, popular intellectuals at times, um, politicians who were also intellectuals, um, as well as their trained and lay publics. In conversing with them, attending their classes, reading their works, and speaking to their audience, I was trying to understand the popular emergence of European social theory among a diverse set of social actors and knowledge practitioners in the 1990s and 2000s. Uh, some of the questions that framed the projects were how is it that despite the anti-Western rhetoric of the 1979 revolution, uh, the constitution of the post-revolutionary um, Islamic Republic, as well as institutions, language and grammar, of law and politics were adopted from European models. How is it that the, in the midst of a campaign aimed at uh, what, is, uh, what is referred to as Islam Sazi, Islamicization of education, the very seminarians and uh, state bureaucrats in charge of the project of Islamicization um, are deeply engaged with uh, European social and theoretical discourses. Um, and what is, after all, uh, the place of translation of European social thought and political philosophy in development, development of modern Iran? Uh, as I engaged with my interlocutors, the more I became familiar with the history and the epistemic significance of translation of European discourses and forms, 
in modern Iran. Since the early decades of the 19th century, translation has been central to various projects of political and religious reform and revolution uh, that constitute the epistemic and political world that we call modern Iran. So then my dissertation has tried to situate the um, ethnographic present where many social uh, actors are engaged in the practice of reading and translation in a longer history and a genealogy that includes 19th century travel writing of uh, first generation of Iranian students uh, who were sent to Europe to learn European languages, to learn about European discourses, such as Mirza Saleh Shirazi, the author of the famous Safar Mani Mirza Saleh, as well as uh, 19th century, 20th century anti Western discourses of revolution and um, reform. Even the most um, uh, creators of what uh, anti imperialist and uh, Islamic revolutionary discourses were deeply engaged uh, again with certain strands of European critical traditions, Nazism, existentialism, phenomenology, and other, other uh, discourses. And I'm trying to sort of analyze the present, contextualize the present in this longer history. Um, and um, sort of highlighting the epistemic significance of translation in Iran is also the basis of what I like to contribute and I think the dissertation contributes to a conversation in anthropology and social theory more generally about Eurocentrism, Eurocentrism and the possibilities of non-Eurocentric or decolonial practices of knowledge and theory. Um, I have tried to demonstrate that in addition to the history of European thinking and politics, our conversation and scholarly practices enter different times and confront distinct forms of cultural and political closure that require critical thematization. In other words, uh, it's not um, that I am doing in a study of translation in Iran in order to uh, ask what does the tra translation in Iran offer us Anglophone anthropology or social theory, but I am also hoping to contribute to a conversation that asks how do we, we who have complex histories, attachments, speak in multiple languages and discourses, including the discourse of social theory, um, can contribute to a conversation whose political and epistemological location is not in Europe or North America. Um, that is the kind of uh, work that I think translation in Iran, as Iranians who are engaged with tra practice of translation of other discourses for various political and social projects can teach us. Mm -hmm. In this vein, my, um, in terms of how I uh, understand and theorize translation, uh, my findings, my work tries to demonstrate that in Iran, translation emerges in relationship to the Lost and limit, lost and limitations of earlier ways of knowing that they're centered in and around uh, pedagogical discourses of Shia seminaries and the Iranian court, drawing on theories of my ethnographic and historical textual interlocutors, as well as thinkers of um, political violence such as Hannah Arendt, Franz Fanon, Yatsa Benjamin, I interpret uh, violence in political history of modern Iran in relationship to loss of discursive frames that mediate social and political belonging. And in this context, theorize the reparative and generative uh, capacities of translation in relationship to such losses. In other words, I argue that translation is at once manifestation of loss of earlier ways of knowing and an attempt at cultural uh, regeneration, that translation addresses the poetic capacities of a culture in the context of loss and regeneration. Of course, um, this work also demonstrates that framings of Iran and Islam and Europe and Euro-American worlds as other to each other is deeply, deeply narrow-minded. Uh, of course, revolutionary translations of European discourses in Iran point to what I describe as a learned politics, one that is attuned to translation and translatability and transference between very distinct, how 
yet interrelate, interrelated historical discourses. Um, let me end there. And I'll be happy to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's great. You know <clears throat> that um, uh, again, both of your works uh, really uh, situates Iran in such an unfamiliar territory for for a lot of you know people who live in the West. And uh, in the U.S., um, I uh, uh, remember some years ago, um, uh, Tom Friedman of New York Times uh, editorial, he said that, you know, uh, people in the Middle East should uh, start reading the founding texts of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, founding philosophers, uh, like Kant and, uh, and John Locke, and, and, <laughs> and I thought that, you know, like uh, uh, as he does in every other country, I, I said that, you know, I, I hope that he would just take a stroll in front of Tehran University and, and see the bookstores and see what is translated in Iran, you know, like, uh, and, uh, but uh, yeah, these are the type of work that, 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 uh, uh, really uh, both of your works uh, that offers um, deeply counterintuitive uh, pictures and uh, uh, this kind of uh, counterintuitiveness of the work uh, is uh, so uh, grand and so amazing and and uh, and uh, with the kind of uh, kind of intellectual care that you put into your work I, I think this is just uh, going to be uh, such fantastic uh, uh, work uh, and, and soon hopefully we see both of your works in, uh, in print and many other people can also read and, and, uh, and uh, enjoy. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I know that uh, unfortunately we are uh, virtual at this moment uh, but uh, once you're here, uh, we are going to uh, uh, invite you to give uh, uh, more um, <clears throat> substantive uh, talks about your work and your future projects. Uh, and I wanted to just take this opportunity to introduce you to uh, our community and, uh, and, uh, and welcome you again. Uh, um, although uh, not in person, uh, but uh, but virtually to to Princeton, and um, and uh, and again, um, uh, this is uh, uh, truly our privilege to, to privilege to, to have both of you uh, amongst us, uh, and uh, and we have more conversations soon, uh, and. Uh, and the more engagement with your work. Uh, uh, and I know, and I speak for, uh, 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 on behalf of many other people that who are all very excited uh, to have you as part of our community. So uh, we'll see more of you soon. And, uh, and uh, thank you and stay safe, healthy, and COVID free. Thank you. And, <laughs> and we'll see you soon, okay? Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye for now.